So this lecture is going to continue on our module looking at uh, on members uh, subjected to compression forces and how we design those, uh, particularly when it comes to steel members. So in the uh, sort of previous lecture, we were looking at global buckling uh, of a member and that was and how all of that derived from Euler buckling. Now, if you remember from that lecture, one of the um, aspects which would limit um, our ability to reach the Euler buckling, critical buckling load, is if we under, if the section underwent some local buckling uh, before it yielded. And so uh, that's what we're going to go over today is a, a little bit about some of the background on uh, local buckling and, and plate buckling and how it's found. Uh, and how it's derived, and then how we use that in the uh, design equations. So jumping right in, what you'll see here is I have a little diagram uh, of some plate. So, you know, this is a, a plate, and I've got that it's simply supported on all four sides, which really means that it can move in and out, and it can rotate, but it, it can't move up and down, sort of uh, out of plane at the edge. And, um, well, if we put some um, axial load N, on there and push it together, well, uh, it makes sense. It's going to buckle. It's going to buckle in a shape like this, where you can see sort of the curved uh, lines there. Well, we'll buckle a whole bunch in the middle and then, you know, sort of uh, spread out on, on the edge, uh, about down to where we are uh, supported along the edge. Well, um, it, for many things in design, we want to take this physical phenomenon and uh, use mathematics to write an equation so that we can utilize it uh, as a design tool. And so if you do that, you find that it's kind of this really uh, nasty fourth order differential equation. Uh, but if you go through all the rigmarole of solving that and you want to find out, well, what is this value n uh, at the point of buckling? Uh, what you get is, is this sort of uh, rather large and cumbersome equation where the critical buckling load of this plate uh, equals n squared pi squared ei over n squared 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared plus 1 plus 2 ml over nb whole thing squared ml over nb to the fourth where um, m is the number of sine waves or half sine waves so think of that as sort of these bumps um, across the width of the plate so what's drawn here is just sort of m equals 1 uh, and n is the number of half sine waves uh, along the length of the plate. And so for uh, what we've drawn here, uh, both m and n equal 1. So uh, loads are really good when we're looking at uh, sort of something from a member perspective. But when we're looking at a cross section, uh, it's really easier for us to think about things in terms of stresses. So you think about, uh, you know, if you're designing a beam and bending, you look at the maximum uh, compression and tensile, um, tensile stress, which uh, is the member is subjected to, and you, can, and you compare that back to some limit. So uh, while you know, critical buckling loads are a useful place for us to get started, really what we care about are these stresses. So well, how do we go from a load to a stress? Well, really, we just divide by the area. So the area in this case of this plate is the width of the plate uh, divided and multiplied by uh, the thickness of the plate. So it's just B times T. So if we do that, um, and we go really from a, a critical load to a critical stress, uh, what we'll find is, uh, is exactly what we're doing, just N over uh, the critical buckling load uh, divided by the area of the plate. Uh, it's going to equal um, this uh, formula over here, this k pi squared times e over 12, 1 minus uh, Poisson squared um, multiplied by this t over b ratio squared. And so, you know, what's this k factor? Well, this k factor uh, is essentially just, a, it's a nicety on helping us deal with different boundary conditions. So uh, we call it this uh, buckling coefficient. And it can equal um, a couple of different things. So, and it's dependent really upon uh, what our boundary conditions are. So k equals 4 if we have all four sides simply supported. So similar to what we have uh, represented up here. 
But where would we find that? Well, I've drawn a, a little example for you there where um, uh, this would be like if you have uh, yeah, the web of a, um, uh, of a compression member. So say that we have you know, the force pushing in this way uh, along the, the length of the element. So I'll just you know, draw that in there in, in pencil. So say you've got your force N coming in here. Well, if we were to take a little slice of this web out and, and look at the stresses and sort of model it like what we've done up here at the top, well, it makes sense that, you know, the top and the bottom are, are simply supported. They're connected. Well, that's, that's exactly where um, the web connects to the flange, so that makes sense. Uh, but what about longitudinally? Well, think about, you know, this little slot that's getting cut out, you know, there's some distance uh, dx uh, along the length of the member. Well, the, uh, the remainder, uh, well, the, the remaining sort of supports are the, re are the other portions of the web here. So uh, that's how we, we sort of come up with this, you know, four sides simply supported. Two of the sides are coming from the connection to the flange, and two of them are coming to the connection to the rest of the web. And really what we're looking at is we're modeling this single, you know, if this M, uh, which is the uh, number of sine waves sort of uh, across, um, we're really sort of simplified this equation down to both M and N equaling 1. So we're looking at a single sine wave and uh, treating that like a node. So, I mean, if you had yourself a, um, a sine wave here, well, you know, you could treat uh, these points between each half sine wave is sort of like your, your little member. These are your nodes, these are your points of zero um, out of plane movement. And that zero out of plane movement is kind of exactly what we're talking about here uh, with this simply supported condition. So if you think about this instead of a sine wave as a, a little plate uh, moving in and out of plane, well, where there's uh, no movement from the baseline, uh, that's like a support. So that's, uh, you know, hopefully that's a, a useful, um, you know, uh, analogy for, for understanding, you know, why, um, you know, we, we treat this web as four sides simply supported uh, when we're looking at what stress or what, what's this critical stress uh, which is going to cause local buckling. Uh, the other condition which we have is when we have one side free. Uh, so again, if we've got our uh, load uh, being applied uh, down the axis of the member, and we look at just the flange, well, um, just like we said, you know, with this uh, sine wave analogy, uh, two of the edges which are supporting are just the remainder of the flange, uh, and the third side is the connection between the flange and the web, and then this end, uh, just here on the end, uh, is free. It's just floating in air. So, I mean, if you think about a support as, you know, inability to move uh, in and out of uh, the plane of the member, so I guess, uh, you know, inability to move uh, in the direction of the, the thickness of the member, well, that makes sense. You know, this this flange here can, you know, can undergo a little bit of a, a local buckle like that, and it can sort of, we can develop these ripples along there. And so that's what we're looking at. And so if we have this condition, well, we use this Buchan coefficient factor to determine our critical stress. Instead of using four for our um, all four sides simply supported, we use 0 0.5. And so let's just take a, a moment to think about well, what is the consequence of that. Well, uh, we're going to be something like eight times uh, it will be a, a stress which is eight times lower will buckle when we leave one edge unsupported, which should make sense intuitively. I mean, if you have, you know, all four sides connected up and you're squashing it together, um, it's going to be really hard to get that shape to buckle. I mean, you can try this with a, you know, if you take a piece of paper uh, and you try to squeeze everything together, well, you kind of, you kind of can, uh, but it, it's it's hard just even to get the uh, the geometry to work, while if you have, um, you know, three sides uh, and you you push, well, that, that final side there, 
uh, is able to move. It's unrestrained, and so uh, it would make sense that the um, the buckling force, and then uh, by uh, sort of analogy, the buckling stress uh, would be much lower for this case. So uh, that's all good. So we we now have a uh, a critical buckling stress, which would uh, which would occur. Um, that's somewhat useful, but you know what do we, you know how do we how do we deal with that? Um, is there anything more that we need to know uh, before we can start designing uh, our steel sections for uh, compression loads? Well, the the other sort of interesting bit is how um, if if we do initiate buckling, um, well, how do we account for uh, the ability for the uh, the members sort of redistribute stresses? So before we we duck into that, let's just think about this um, uh, buckled shape here. So think just about this line first. Well, as this wants to buckle out, so think about this line is trying to move out a plane of the surface. Well, the rest of the material here is trying to, you know, sort of pull it back down. And what's going to happen is we're going to develop these little tensile stresses um, perpendicular to the uh, um, direction of buckling. So I'm just going to draw them here in pencil, uh, just as these little arrows. Uh, and remember, they're just pretty much coming along the line there. And what's happening is, is as that's trying to buckle out, those are trying to push it back down. So it's like a, uh, uh, like a, like you know, if you're strapping down a, a tarpaulin over um, a vehicle and it's going down the road well the air pressure wants to lift that tarpaulin and then the uh, the straps you've put across it are trying to pull it back down and, you know this is the same sort of thing but instead of sort of these individual straps uh, this is a, a continuous surface and the uh, consequence of that is essentially means that we can if we buckle here we can redistribute stress around and in fact we can take advantage of that and get a higher um, basically our, our structure can or our, our little plate element uh, can take a larger um, stress than what is uh, sort of original at um, you know this onset of critical buckling and so on this next page I've drawn uh, sort of these two cases um, sort of you know what actually happens and and what I mean by that stress redistribution. So the case here on the left is uh, this little block. And I, what I've drawn here in red is sort of what the stress state would be uh, right at buckling. So say, you know, right at, uh, at this case here, at, as soon as we start buckling. Well, just like I said, those little, those, um, you know, the we, we develop those uh, tensile stresses transverse to the direction of of buckling so you know if we we hold this here uh, next to it you know we will buckle in the middle so we can't actually take much load uh, there um, however you know this, these transverse uh, tensile stresses help us redistribute that load out and the consequence of it is means that along the edge where the element is uh, stiffer because it's closer to the support we can actually reach all the way up to the yield stress of the material so if we look across the section, the stress distribution does this sort of, uh, you know, kind of roller coaster shape. Um, and that means that here in the middle, yeah, we've buckled and we can't take a lot of load. Well, this is kind of this really weird, arbitrary shape, rather difficult for design. We like nice, simple shapes for design. Simple shapes are easy to iterate on. And so, um, what you know, the what uh, the design standard uh, NZS three four zero four does is it takes this um, basically this little area here, where you know we would know uh, you know sort of the uh, where, where we can reach the yield stress, and it says we're only going to count that as our section, and we're going to use this effective section. And it's basically this area here where we've buckled in the middle. Um, so if we go back to our original, if we go back to our original diagram, it, it's this very middle area here. We discount its capacity. We pretend like it's not there, and we're only going to use uh, the portion here on the edge. And so that's uh, that's exactly what we do here. And you can see that we have our effective width. We essentially split it into two parts for the two edges, 
and um, we take in instead of B, we take B, uh, B sub E, B E, our effective width. So um, what we kind of want to know is that, you know, well, we, we now have, we've gone from sort of a, a, a nasty, uh, complicated uh, stress distribution to something for design. Well, if we have this um, equation for a critical stress uh, for, you know, the actual yield stress, well, what if uh, for the actual width, the full width, using this stress distribution, well, can we simplify this equation uh, so that we can use it with this effective section approximation? And, uh, and that, that's sort of exactly what we're going to do. So uh, let's just let's work that out really quick. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with our equation for the uh, sort of this critical buckling stress uh, sigma of CR. Uh, we'll just rearrange this so that we can uh, we can still see. So sigma CR uh, obviously equals the uh, critical load over the entire area uh, divided by the area B times uh, T, and that equals K pi squared E over 12, 1 minus Poisson squared T over B squared. So we just transferred that over from the first page that we looked at, just so it's here uh, as we're going through our calculations. Now, if we want to um, uh, essentially go in and replace uh, this B, with this B sub E, uh, what we're going to, and then we want to look at instead of, um, you know, we want to be at B sub E, and we want to look at, you know, what is the, if the, if our critical stress equals our yield stress. So we want to go from here to here, and essentially, and just as a reminder, all we're doing is we're just essentially just fiddling with this equation so that we can discount this middle section and get uh, an equivalent, if you would, sort of, um, you know, more or less an equivalent area uh, between sort of, you know, here and here. It's, a, it's not quite an equivalent area, but it's maybe a good way to think about it, where um, we're, we're just going to discount the middle. That's the big thing to keep in mind. Uh, the effective uh, section uh, discounts the middle because it has buckled. So... Um, you know, for the effective width um, and this is again at failure uh, it's going to be a, a yield of a section instead of a buckle of a section that's the approximation that we're using so at failure, and I'll put failure in quotes here, um, sigma CR equals sigma Y with the effective width. All right, well, let's just plug um, this into the equation, and then what we'll get if sigma CR is going to equal sigma Y well, let's just say sigma y equals k times pi squared times e over 12 times 1 minus Poisson's squared uh, times t. And now instead of b, we'll use b sub e squared. All right, and um, basically, if we, you know, if we look at these two equations, well, what this gives us is really a ratio between, um, you know, if we, we need to figure out some way to, to determine what this width um, B sub E is. And if we look at these two equations and we do a little bit of algebra, uh, what we find is that our ratio of 
Um, effective width over the actual width equals um, B sub E over B and um, that just equals the critical buckling load divided by the yield load square root. So this is this is quite useful. I mean, we we have terminology. We've got equations in order to find this critical buckling stress. Our yield stress is uh, you know just a material property. Uh, we know the width, so we can determine what this um, this effective width b b sub e is now. Um, and then uh, an another thing which is sort of useful to see uh, looking at this equation is that really, you know, b sub e is only smaller than our original width uh, when our critical buckling is smaller than our yield stress. Um, you know, that, that, that should make some sense, right? You know, if, um, if we were to yield uh, long, so say the material was really, uh, really soft, um, and we yielded the material long before we buckled it, well, we'd actually, we could just take advantage of the entire width. We wouldn't have to worry about this effective width because, um, you know, we, we would have yielded before we buckled. But, you know, as I've drawn it here, our yield stress is much higher than our critical buckling stress, and this is why we need to use this um, uh, piece of E. Um, and so, you know, this, you know, all of this phenomenon, all of this buckling is really based upon, I mean, if we, we look at this equation, well, this is a boundary condition, uh, that's a constant, that's a constant, that's a material property, uh, Poisson's ratio is a material property. Really, the only thing which it is dependent upon is um, our thickness and our width. So, it'd be a lot nicer to try to get this equation in terms of some ratio of our thickness to width, some some slenderness ratio, and so um, uh, that's that's what we'll do. We're, let's just try to rearrange this equation so that instead of you know looking at it in terms of y, uh, we look at it in terms of b and t. And the reason that we want uh, of instead of um, sigma y uh, with terms of, of uh, thickness and the width. And the reason that we want to do that is when we're designing members, uh, the thickness and the width is something that is uh, easy for us to change. Uh, material properties, uh, so the yield strength and uh, the, the stiffnesses are, are kind of locked in. There's only so many structural materials which we can buy. And um, so these properties are a lot more limited. However, you know, thickness and, and width of steel plate um, is, a, is a very arbitrary uh, and gives us a lot of flexibility. So this is why we want to go from uh, our, our equation in terms of yield stress uh, in terms of uh, basically think about it uh, like a uh, slenderness limit. So um, let's just do that. Um, just go re arrange in terms of B sub E and T. Um, in fact, we'll just we won't even do B sub E. We'll just do it in terms of B for right now. Um, uh, it's getting a little bit messy. We'll just go of uh, T and B. There we go. So, um, if we do that and we, we go through the algebra gymnastics, uh, what we find out is that our uh, B over T ratio uh, has to be equal to K pi squared E over 12 
times 1 minus Poisson squared sigma y. All of that take to the square root. Well, let's, you know, we're, we're working with, we're, you know, this, this is a, a course looking at steel design. Let's plug in, you know, some of these constants for, um, you know, say a, um, a, a typical steel. So um, if we do that and we look at, say, you know, if E equals 200,000 megapascal, uh, Poisson's ratio equals 0 0.3 and our yield stress uh, let's use 250 MPa. The reason that we're doing uh, 250 instead of say 300 or grade 350 is because what I want to show you is um, what we have here is a slenderness ratio and the um, uh, the design standard is really all uh, in terms of determining whether we're going to have local buckling or not. It's all built around uh, these uh, slenderness ratios. So uh, what I'd like to see is if we we plug in uh, these properties and then our k values for you know whether we're looking at say a uh, a web or a flange. I want to see well how close are they to what's in our design standard NZS three four zero four. And so the reason that we're using 250 MPa is when all of these um, uh, slenderness limits were made, um, you know, grade 250 um, steel was the most common. So uh, that's what we're going to look at here. So, um, you know, for, for a web, um, and, you know, if we remember back to here for a web, um, our k factor is going to be 4. So k equals 4. So our um, b over t ratio is going to equal 4 times pi squared times 200,000 over 12 times 1 minus 0 0.3 squared uh, times 250 MPa, MPa, and all of that we're going to take the square root. And so uh, essentially what this is going to give us is a slenderness limit for the web uh, which is just going to equal uh, the width of the web divided by the thickness of the web. And we find that all of this equals 53.8. So let's take a let's take a quick moment to you know think about well why, um, you know, what, is this, what does this mean? Well, uh, this means that if you have a, uh, a web um, where your slenderness, so say your, your thickness, uh, so your width over your thickness is um, less than uh, this limit, well, then that means that you're going to squash uh, before you buckle. So you're, you're going to have this, uh, you know, you know uh, the, Basically, what's written up here is going to be inverted. Um, if you have a limit which is greater than this, uh, then you are going to um, uh, you're going to buckle first, and so then you have to take into account and you've got to downgrade uh, your uh, sort of your uh, overall width into a um, an effective width. So that's just uh, that's just a slenderness limit. So if um, if you're more slender than this, so if this number's higher, uh, you'll buckle. Uh, if it's lower, uh, then you're a stocky element and you will squash first. So we've done this for a web. Let's have a look at it for a flange. So 
So if we look at for a flange, um, and we go back to you know when we were first looking at these k values, uh, we see that for a flange, our k equals uh, 0 0.5, and so um, what we end up with is um, with the flange over the thickness of the flange equals 0 0.5. I squared times 200,000 MPa divided by 12 times 1 minus 0 0.3 squared times 250 MPa. And if we work all of that out, uh, we get a uh, lambda f equals b sub f over t sub f equals 19. So uh, I guess what I want to do now is look at, I want to compare these limits, which we've, which we've derived just now, um, these slenderness limits. Uh, for our web and for our flange uh, with what's in um, the New Zealand standard. So let's just do a little little table of um, slenderness limits. Uh, we'll do, uh, this will be our uh, Derived, and this will be uh, from um, we'll do NZS three four zero four. And we'll do first uh, the web and then the flange. That's lambda w, and that's lambda f. So, uh, and then we'll just, boom. Um, so we have lambda f right here, that's 19. And then from our previous page, uh, lambda w is, uh, we'll just call this, um, we'll just round and, and just call this 54. All right, so let's just go over to the New Zealand standard and see um, what the, uh, you know, if we have um, the uh, slenderness limits that they have here. So um, the case here is going to be the case number one. This is for flat type elements. Um, we have a little bit of a shift here in the PDF, but this is a uh, longitudinal edges supported. Uh, we've got one here and we've got two here. Uh, the residual stress notes. So say we're going to look at these uh, hot rolled sections. So you can see HR is hot rolled. So uh, the yield slenderness that which they give for the um, uh, for the for the flange is um, 16, and for the web uh, where we have two edges, uh, two longitudinal edges supported uh, for hot rolled. Uh, is going to be 45. So if we come back to our um, our little table, we can see that um, these limits are much lower than what we derived. So the question is, um, you know, you know, why why is this for these slenderness limits lambda e y? Um, and it really comes down to uh, they account for um, uh, sort of impurities, and really the big one is residual stresses. So um, we'll say discrepancies with lambda EY in NZS. 3404 
and with derived. values is due mainly to accounting for residual stresses. Excellent. Well, um, yeah, and that, that's that's essentially you know what we're going to do uh, as we use these in design is um, we're going to you know for for a given you know eye section uh, we want to find what these slenderness limits are. Find out um, you know for above if a if a given uh, plate element is uh, above or um, that uh, slenderness limit means it's more slender, means it's more likely to buckle. Um, if that's the case, then we need to downrate its uh, capacity uh, using this effective section. If it is um, you know, below these limits, it means it's a stocky section and it is more likely to buckle. So uh, the last thing that I want to look at here is just really uh, how, you know, just run through a little bit of the application of uh, NZS 3404 for compression members. And uh, just really as a brief overview and kind of just drive home uh, a little bit of how we're going to use what we've just derived. So um, let's go application. To NZS three four oh four. And um, if we if we look that up for the section capacity, uh, we'd have N star, so our demand has to be less than or equal to phi ends of S. And you can find this in ZS three four oh four in section six point one. And um, you know, phi is just going to equal this is just our strength reduction factor, so phi is typically uh, zero point nine and n of s equals um, Kf uh, times the net area times uh, the yield stress. And so um, this Kf is what is called the form factor. And this is really, you know, essentially our buckling factor. Um, an equals the uh, net area, uh, which is essentially just the uh, gross area minus the area of any holes. Um, and uh, really, there's a if for for a small enough hole size, you can actually just take the uh, the net area as the gross area, and we'll look at that in just a bit. And then we have Fy equals the uh, yield stress um, of the section. Um, so it's probably worth just going back over and having a little bit of a look at uh, some of these provisions in a bit more detail um, because there's a few subtleties which are important. So just going back to the standard here, uh, so um, you know this is our, our equation for uh, n stars to be less than equal of n's of s. And then if we look at this ends of S, this form factor, we will look at in a moment, um, this uh, alpha N, so the net area for cross-section, uh, we can basically take it as uh, uh, what this whole paragraph is saying, is that um, we can ignore any holes in the cross-sectional area 
if they're below a certain amount. Uh, and it's below this amount here. And so for, and it, it's really you know, based upon a ratio of your yield stress to your ultimate stress. Um, this is, uh, you know, a, a approximately 18% if you're using grade 300, um, re, uh, grade 300 steel. The reason that uh, this is allowed is when you're in compression, well, why you would have holes is really when you have a column splice. And so for uh, a column splice, uh, the holes are relatively small for um, the, uh, the area which you're looking at and the uh, compression forces are, are able to really uh, work their way around. Um, the other point of, of sort of subtlety here is which yield stress to use. Um, if you remember, you know, in um, New Zealand and Australia, where the uh, yield strength of a material is dependent upon its thickness, um, the typical I section, so UBs and UCs um, in, uh, in New Zealand and Australia, have different thickness flanges from the web. So uh, which do you use? Well, uh, the standard gives you two options. You can either use uh, the minimum yield stress, or you can take a weighted average, so based upon the area of the, um, you know, say, uh, of the flanges versus the web, um, or if you have a built-up section, uh, as you see fit. Um, often the easier thing in design, particularly when you first start iterating, is simply to take the uh, minimum value, um, and it, it's often, uh, you know, just, you know, sufficient anyways, because uh, you're not going to see a huge uh, change in capacity. So, um, we'll just come right back and we'll just write down uh, this little subtlety with uh, alpha n. Um, we'll go because of column splices an equals ag if the area of holes is less than approximately 18% AG for grade 300 steel. And we'll just put that little note. And you know, for those of you who might be confused by what I mean about a column splice, um, it's essentially so if you have, because um, you know, steel is made in, in a fixed length, and um, you know, it's uh, buildings tend to be taller than uh, steel is made. Uh, and even if you don't have your steel uh, made to that, or even you can get your steel made longer, uh, you still have to transport it to, to site. And so, say you've got a column coming in from the top and a column coming in from the bottom. Well, like I said, you know, steel is a fixed length, so we have to join these uh, pieces together. And how do we do that? Well, you know, one way is just set them on top of each other. Uh, that's not a terribly stable way to do it. And so instead, uh, a splice will get made where there'll be a plate. Um, which joins the two, and it is typically bolted on site, and you might have, uh, depending upon the demands, you might have plates on, you know, both sides of the flange, you might have them on the web, and um, this is why you, you're going to end up with holes, even if you have this element in compression um, and so uh, that's what you know this little note is here to help uh, help you navigate that and take full advantage of your capacity all right so uh, just backing up uh, just a just a little bit we, we've looked at um, alpha n and fn uh, what is this k factor uh, so this case of f so case of f this form factor uh, simply equals our effective area over our gross area, and that's just NZS 3404 6.2.2. .2. 
And this is where we uh, account for local buckling. And, and really what, the, what the, this form factor is doing is it is a, um, you know, it, it's downgrading our overall capacity because really all we have here is just essentially an area times a stress equal to a force. Well, you know, if we, uh, if we buckle uh, before we can get to that full yield stress uh, that we have here, well, we need to account for that. So uh, the way that we determine this... Um, uh, effective area so you know AE equals the effective area of the section and A sub E uh, simply equals the summation of the thickness of each element. I guess we'll go from I equals 1 to N um, times uh, the effective width of each element. And so, um, and the effective width, B sub E, simply equals uh, the width of the section times lambda EY over lambda E all has to be less than or equal to B. So that's a that's a lot of letters and um, and, and fancy equations but you know what is this what does this mean? Well it means that what we do is we go element by element of a given uh, cross-section. And we look at the width and the thickness of that element um, relative to these slenderness ratios from the standard. And, um, and then we compare, you know, where are we at on that, uh, that ratio uh, to uh, the slenderness limits, and then we multiply that by, by B. So just going back to the standard, uh, quickly, uh, what you'll see is there's our, our uh, form factor case of F, and then our slenderness ratio is just this, uh, as I said, the width over uh, the thickness, and then we have this multiplier um, Fy over 250, and this is really just to account for the fact that these slenderness limits were originally derived for uh, grade 250 steel. Um, grade 300 is more uh, common now and also grade 350 uh, so this just helps us uh, take into account those those different um, uh, yield stresses and then um, in looking at the effective width like I said uh, we will compare this um, lambda e uh, to the appropriate lambda e y for whether it's a flange or whether it is a web and then uh, based upon if we're lower than this limit, great. Uh, then uh, we're going to um, uh, we're, we're, we're going to squash before we um, we yield, and that makes sense too. So if lambda e y is less than uh, if lambda e is less than lambda e y, so if this b over t, uh, say if we look here, it's like our b over t. If it was less than uh, this limit here, well this becomes greater than 1, greater than 1 times b, and it has to be less than or equal to b. Cool, our effective width equals the width of the section. Um, however, if we're more slender, uh, you can see that we're just going to reduce down our effective width simply by that ratio of where that slenderness is. And so, um, lambda ey, is just coming from uh, table 6.2.4 and it's an ends at S3404 so again flange equals 16 
web equals 45. And there's you know slightly different limits if we have a, uh, a circular section, but um, that's much the same. And then we determine our lambda e is just b over t times fy 250 square root. So, uh, you know, what our, uh, I guess, our step-by-step -step is, is we determine our slenderness ratio for uh, each, uh, you know, section of a, um, uh, you know, each element in a section. So if we have um, an I section here, we would determine our slenderness ratio first for the flange. Um, and then we would compare it to our limit and then get work out an effective width and then we'd work out our slenderness limit for the web compare it to our limit and get an effective width and then we've worked out our effective area which is just the sum of each of these uh, thicknesses times the effective width um, compare that with the the overall gross area of the section that gives us our form factor and um, and then we just multiply our form factor by alpha n and fy, and then ta-da, we have our section capacity and compression. So uh, I hope you found that uh, helpful and and sort of uh, as a nice introduction and overview of how um, sort of the New Zealand standard uh, for uh, steel design for compression members uh, takes into account these local buckling and you know again hopefully you. And now it's not quite a mystery where just some of these numbers come from. You can see we, we derive them here actually quite quickly and all within an hour. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for watching and uh, you know stay tuned for the next video where we'll run through uh, a little bit of a demonstration on uh, how do we use these provisions now that we, we know where they come from. So thanks for watching.